Perpetually off in the distance, the horizon is where the known and unknown meet, where what we can see meets what we can only imagine is beyond, where the choices we've made meet the options we may be presented, and where what we've done meets the potential of what we may do. Today is Mother's Day, an observance I've I have found it difficult to not acknowledge annually on this Sunday morning. The FTD florist and Harry and David have been thoughtfully sending me emails for weeks with gift suggestions to choose from. And for most of us, mothers were the ones, were the ones to guide our first choices and present us with our first options. Perhaps she led us to believe the possibilities beyond that horizon were limitless. Perhaps she wasn't quite able to grasp and share such an expansive worldview, but did her best to look up and out and upon the rock, the river, the tree, your country. Even within one village, the view of the horizon is different for each person. Each is in a different place. One is taller than the next. Some can see farther than others, which is why it is useful and interesting to find out what each imagines, what options they see for themselves and others, and what they think the possibilities might be. The African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child, tell us, tells us that in order to provide a safe and secure, healthy environment for children, it takes many people. These people include not only parents, but siblings, extended family members, neighbors, and teachers. They help create an environment where children can flourish and realize their hopes and dreams. I've been lucky that my parents are not only still around, I had all four grandparents well into my 30s, and one grandmother didn't pass away until I was in my late 50s and in seminary. I had aunts and uncles and cousins. It was a village of support. Since that time, people's villages are often more fragmented than I experienced. People are more isolated, which the pandemic only exacerbated, as Natalie was talking about. And extended working hours for both parents has added to the loss of connection. Now, of course, it can be even more difficult for single parents. People have reminded me previously after speaking about mothers on Mother's Day and fathers on Father's Day that single parents have had to be both mom and dad. And I applaud the Herculean efforts that I have difficulty even grasping. It's so important to have a village of support. I would suggest that's a good reason to be here. I often hear people say they started coming to church when they realized their kids needed to be around some other good adult role models, meet some great kids their own age, and learn about values. There's an old joke that you use are atheists with kids. <laughs> Yesterday, the coming-of-age youth had their end-of-the-year ceremony. On the brink of adulthood, they are facing much change and many decisions. They had each worked with a mentor throughout the entire program, and I understand those relationships sometimes continue on. These mentors are church members whose view of the horizon is unique and can point out possibilities and guide them in their choices. The horizon leans forward, offering you space to place new steps of change. Here on the pulse of this fine day, you may have the courage to look up and out and upon me, the rock, the river, the tree, your country. Many years ago, I read the wildly popular self-help book for job seekers, What Color Is Your Parachute? Author Richard Nelson Bowles recommends networking to find a mentor as well as the person with the authority to hire you. 
The book also suggests discovering both what you are best at and what you enjoy most, and claims that these often coincide. Similarly, the respected author and theologian Frederick Beekner told us, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. That quote was ringing in my ears when I decided to go to seminary. In my working toward full fellowship as a UU minister, I've had a series of mentors during seminary and internships, and of course while here. Mentors have been gazing for a long time at the part of the horizon you're interested in, and their perspective can be invaluable. And while it's valuable to find a mentor, it's also valuable to be a mentor. I've talked about having been in Toastmasters for many years. It works by peer evaluation, and those of us who had done it a while would coach newcomers. Then in turn, they would coach people as well, because everyone's opinion can be useful. I earlier described all, all, uh, excuse me, all of the relatives in the village of my youth. What I didn't appreciate then was that while each had a unique view of the horizon, they were standing pretty closely together. Being the first in my family to graduate from college, all the advice about possibilities and options and choices were based upon the wisdom they had gathered from their experience. When we engage mentors and peers from other villages through higher education and travel, we see what other possibilities are viable and that we might consider. Mark Twain wrote, Travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. As our fourth principle states, we affirm a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We don't believe that once we've found the one correct doctrine prescribed by those who cannot be questioned, we're finished gazing at the horizon. The horizon leans forward, offering you space to place new steps of change. So clearly this mentoring doesn't apply only to life skills and job seeking. I like to think of the third principle as sort of our peer encouragement or spiritual mentoring of one another, acceptance of one another, and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. The person next to you has a view you may not have considered, and you may have one that might not have occurred to them. Presented with more options and possibilities, we can make better choices even about what approach to spirituality we might consider and that might work better for us. Of course, there are those who don't really want us to have more options. Back in 1909, Henry Ford famously declared that a customer can have a car painted any color he wants as long as it's black. While a website lists more than 40 different flavors of Coca-Cola, we typically have only two viable candidates to choose from every four years for president. Creedal churches ask that you sign on to the set of beliefs they espouse. You're not to choose for yourself if you are to be part of their community. Well, as a covenantal, not creedal community, we encourage you, after thoughtful consideration, to choose which theology works best for you, which very well may evolve and be different in five years. In fact, mystic and activist Thomas Merton told us, if the you of five years ago doesn't consider the you of today a heretic, you're not growing spiritually. Our propensity for thinking and choosing for ourselves has historically led to both Unitarians and Universalists to be labeled as heretics. Of course, a heretic is someone who espouses or commits heresy, which is any belief strongly at variance with established beliefs, especially religious ones. 
Interestingly, the English word heresy is derived from the ancient Greek word heresis, which originally meant choice or thing chosen. Now, last week, I read an excerpt from Robert Wedderburn's Truth Self-Supported, a refutation of certain doctrinal errors generally adopted in the Christian church. In it, he rejects the doctrine of the Trinity and sets up his argument against the divinity of Jesus. While controversial now, it was downright heretical in 1802 in England. Now, some of the heretical beliefs, both Unitarians and Universalists historically held, were diametrically opposed to the beliefs of John Calvin who was a theologian during the Protestant Reformation. Calvin claimed that humans are inherently sinful and depraved. While we may have been born good, he argued, what he called the original sin of Adam and Eve has corrupted everyone. Calvin, jolly fellow that he was, asserted people were so warped by original sin that, quote, Everything which our mind conceives, meditates, plans, and resolves is always evil, end quote. I doubt that he was invited to a lot of parties. <laughs> well, I believe we were born good and not inherently sinful and depraved. I believe it unnecessarily shifts the focus. The point is, each and every day, we have the option to make choices that are good or bad, kind or hurtful. And as the Dalai Lama told us, be kind whenever possible. It is always possible. Religious progressives tend to stop after we were born good and not buy into either the original sin or predestination arguments predestination being another sermon altogether. This is reflected in our first principle, wherein we affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Now, the newly formed Unitarian Universalist Association worded it a bit differently in 1961 during the merger. In Artic Article 2 of the bylaws, it was stated, to affirm, defend, and promote the supreme worth of every human personality the dignity of man, and the use of the democratic method in human relationships. Well, after shaking the sexist language from my ears, what I first noticed was the linking of a particular system of being in community, meaning the democratic method, with a fundamental belief about human nature, the inherent worth and dignity of all humans. In a reflection on democracy and interdependence on the Side with Love website, Reverend Ashley Horan writes, in essence, it's an if-then statement. If we believe that all humans are born whole and loved rather than sinful and depraved, then we must create institutions and societies in which every person is equally empowered to determine as a part of the collective what is best for the people. If the people are born with the twin blessings of agency and conscience, then they must be trusted to govern themselves. As in, participate by making choices for themselves and the society in which they live. Small wonder our fifth principle affirms the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and society at large. Our annual meeting is coming up where members have the opportunity to vote for leaders and other important issues affecting this specific church community. Also, our congregation spent a great deal of time, effort, and money on the get out the vote campaigns during the last several election cycles. We were focusing our efforts on those neighborhoods with low voter turnout. There are elected persons in our country, especially this state, who work via gerrymandering and other methods to suppress voting by those they suspect may vote against them. Instead, 
we believe everyone has a right to have their vote counted. Voter suppression isn't the only way choices are limited, of course. <laughs> I sometimes think of the techniques some clever parents use to limit the choices of children. Would you like to wear the blue shirt or the red shirt? While giving the ch child the choice of shirts and some degree of autonomy, it excludes any choice which would allow the child to be dressed as Batman at his aunt's wedding. In high school, where I grew up, we might choose between playing football or baseball, or of course basketball, it was Kentucky. But if none of the high schools in the county, but none of the high schools in the county had a pool. So choosing swimming or diving wasn't an option. We could choose to play trumpet or trombone, but not violin or cello. There was band, but no orchestra. Other choices are limited due to unfair laws or hateful cultures of oppression. The Texas legislation, legislature is missing no opportunity to deny health care options to women and trans folks. Redlining limited the options of where black families could buy homes for many decades. And class and poverty patterns to this day reflect those red lines and restrictions. Families missing out on generations of home value appreciation and home equity continues to affect families of color. Systemic or institutional oppression are policies and practices at the organizational level that perpetuate oppression. While individual oppression is defined as a person's beliefs and actions that serve to perpetuate oppression. America's focus on personal responsibility and personal salvation tends to shift the focus away from systemic oppression, which is where the work to really make substantial change may be needed. It's not uncommon to hear someone say, but I'm not racist, while enjoying the benefits of a system that perpetuates racism or classism. People will say, why are they living on the street and asking me for money, rather than what kind of country allows its most vulnerable citizens to live on the streets? After yet another mass shooting, it's asked, what is the matter with these people, rather than look at the system that allows the carnage? This is why our proposed eighth principle asks us to promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by building a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. I'm reminded of the quote by Abraham Joshua Heschel, few are guilty, but all are responsible. I reiterate, we affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person, which means we believe in those persons' right to choose and decide for themselves. Mothers and mentors and villagers are fighting for that right, pointing toward the horizon, pointing out options and choices and possibilities for themselves and those that look up to them. The horizon leans forward, offering you space to place new steps of change. Here, on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face, your country, and say simply, very simply, with hope, good morning. And amen.